J Joe, it's true. I, I was, uh, in April of 1961, I was in college. And I was not even yet an honorary Cuban. <laughs> it was later that I became an honorary Cuban. I'm very proud to be. I, um, I have a new book coming out. Some of you may know I have a new book. It's called Castro's Secrets, the CIA and the Cuban Intelligence Machine. There's a lot about the Kennedys, Bobby and Jack Kennedy in my book. So I think that, uh, I think that tonight I will try also to speak largely about the Kennedys and the CIA. None of this what, that I'll be sharing with you tonight is, uh, is, is in my new book. There's going to be an event here on the, on the 30th of this month when I will present the book. So maybe I'll see some of you then. I look forward to that if you can, if you can make it. Um, I'm, going to, I'm going to speak really about a, um, the, a preamble, a very important part of the preamble to the Bay of Pigs. The presidential campaign in 1960 uh, some of you, many of us remember it. It was the closest, uh, the closest election of any until 2000, when there, there can't possibly, in, Amer in American, America's political future, be an election closer than the one in 2000. But until then, the 1960 election between Nixon and Kennedy has, had been the closest. And my, my conclusion, and it's not just mine, it's that of many historians, is that the Cuba issue and the way Jack Kennedy exploited and hammered away on the Cuba issue was the single most decisive factor in his defeat of Richard Nixon by a very, as you, as you recall, a very small margin. Um, Kennedy, Kennedy came up with a brilliant strategy for, uh, for fighting, for, for, for trying to defeat Nixon. Uh, he campaigned on domestic issues to Nixon's left, and on critical national security issues, he campaigned, surprisingly campaigned, to Nixon's right. He campaigned as a more conservative national security spokesman than Nixon, but pretty hard to do when you, when you, when you remember uh, Richard Nixon's history. But Jack Kennedy campaigned to the right of Nixon on Cuba and on the so-called missile gap. There really was no missile gap, Kennedy, but Kennedy used it very effectively against Nixon and Eisenhower. Uh, and he campaigned on, uh, on, on the need for much stronger and tougher policies uh, toward Latin America to Nixon's right on these critical national security issues. But most importantly, Cuba. Richard Goodwin was the, uh, the, the number two speechwriter for Kennedy. Ted Sorensen, you recall, was the primary speechwriter, the, the best known. But Richard Goodwin was the second most important uh, speechwriter, did a lot of Kennedy speeches, especially the Cuba speeches. And Goodwin wrote a book, and he said that in, the, uh, uh, in hundreds of speeches, we assailed Nixon and the Republicans for losing Cuba to our communist adversaries. We even found a way to accuse Nixon of having personally lost Cuba, Cuba to Castro. Um, he said in the margin of one speech that uh, the Kennedy delivered somewhere around the United States during, during the campaign, Jack Kennedy scribbled on the margins, they didn't lose Cuba, they gave it away. The issue came up almost everywhere, the issue of Castro and Cuba and, the, and the, rising, the rising tide of Castro communism, it came up uh, in almost every appearance that Kennedy made, whether it was in the Dakotas or in Florida or New York or, uh, or, or Pennsylvania. Cuba always came up. It came up invariably in the question and answer sessions that Kennedy submitted to uh, with, with his audiences. And he consistently took a tough line, a tougher line than Nixon was able to take. Um, in mid-October, just a few weeks before the election, uh, Kennedy told Goodwin, his speechwriter, get me a really good blast against Nixon. Goodwin wrote in his book, I typed out a st another assault on the administration's Cuba policy. That's what, that's what Kennedy wanted, a blast on Cuba. So, so Goodwin provided it. The statement that Goodwin drafted went well beyond even the toughest language on Cuba that Kennedy had used until that time. 
here's what here's what can it was attributed to Kennedy. This was a statement that was issued by the by the Kennedy campaign on Cuba under Kennedy's name. We attempt we must attempt to strengthen the non Batista democratic anti Castro forces in exile and in Cuba itself because they offer eventual hope of overthrowing Castro. Thus far, and this is the critical phrase or sentence, thus far, those fighters for freedom have had virtually no support from our government, from the Eisenhower administration. Well, Kennedy knew that was a lie. Kennedy knew very well that was a lie. And he said it on TV. He said it on TV. Kennedy wasn't doing anything. Exactly. I, I heard that. Exactly. That exactly. How could Lisa Bloom say, hey, we have boys training already? Well, Kennedy was ready. Kennedy was willing. Kennedy was willing to say whatever, whatever he needed to say in order to win. And he knew that the Cuba issue was one of the most volatile. Um, he lied. He knew. He knew from multiple sources, not one or two or three, but from multiple sources. <laughs> that the CIA was planning, with the White House, the Bay of Pigs military intervention. It la he laid a trap, a very successful trap, for Nixon when he issued this statement. Because a few days later, Kennedy and Nixon appeared in the fourth of their televised debates. The fourth and last of their televised debates. And you remember all you remember all the historical discussions about the debates and how important the first debate was because Kennedy looked so much younger and fresher and smarter and he wasn't sweating the way Nixon was. Nixon had just come out of uh, major surgery. He didn't wear makeup. He thought it was unmanly to, to wear makeup, uh, but under the television lights, he sweated profusely. And uh, Kennedy Kennedy didn't care about uh, about uh, about he wore lots of makeup. And Kennedy was cool, and he came across as the winner of that first debate to the television audiences. Interestingly, though, to radio audiences, Nixon won the debate. It was the appearance, Kennedy's appearance and Nixon's appearance in that first debate on the television screen that kind of tipped it. Um, but anyway, in, this, in the fourth debate, Cuba became a primary issue of, uh, of discussion. Nixon was really on the spot because Kennedy, in that statement that I read to you, had laid a trap for him. What could Nixon say? Nixon couldn't say, we're training a brigade of Cuban exiles down in uh, Central America. We've got a really terrific covert action plan ready. With the, we're working with the CIA, uh, and we've got 1,500 men, heroic men, being trained. Nixon couldn't say anything of that. He couldn't say anything. He couldn't admit, he couldn't admit any of it. So Kennedy had really put him on the spot. Here's what Nixon had to say. Nixon said, Kennedy's recommendations for handling Castro are probably the most dangerously irresponsible ones he's made during the course of this campaign. Kennedy was irresponsible for saying what the administration, the Eisenhower administration, was actually doing. Um, it was, of course, exactly what the Republican administration working with the CIA was doing. And Nixon himself had been the earliest advocate of the Bay of Pigs intervention in the, in the Eisenhower administration. He later wrote, Nixon later wrote in one of his memoirs that Kennedy's manipulation this way of the Cuba issue was the single most important factor in, his, in Nixon's defeat in the elections in November. I had no choice, he wrote, but to take a completely opposite stand in that fourth television debate. I had no choice. I had to attack Kennedy's advocacy of open intervention in Cuba. This was the most uncomfortable and ironic duty I ever had to perform in a political campaign. What an irony. After the debate, after this fourth debate, Secretary of, former Secretary of State Dean Acheson, one of the grand old men of American diplomacy, the Truman's, uh, Truman's Secretary of State, uh, met with Kennedy. And um, Kennedy asked him, Kennedy is still the candidate, he's a senator, he's not yet president-elect. He, uh, he asked this great titan of American diplomacy, a Cold War hero, uh, he said, what did you think 
of um, what I said, what I've been saying about Cuba. And Acheson said, you should stop talking about Cuba. I don't think you're, it's going to get you anywhere. You're likely to get hooked into positions that will be very difficult for you afterwards. It was really good advice. But Jack Kennedy, filled with hubris, knowing that uh, he needed the Cuba issue if he was going to defeat Nixon, Kennedy ignored Acheson's sound advice. Kennedy was ag aggressive and astute as a politician. Acheson was a mere diplomat. So everywhere Kennedy campaigned from there forward until, the, until election day, he continued hypocritically to brandish the Cuba issue against the Republicans, specifically against Nixon, in ways that made him the, the most militant of the candidates, the one most committed to supporting freedom fighters against, uh, against Castro. And Nixon and Eisenhower, of course, and the CIA could not admit that they were doing exactly that. Okay, how did, how did Kennedy know and he knew without any doubt. He knew absolutely with certitude, because he knew from multiple unimpeachable sources. There were four principal sources. There were, there were really a couple of others as well, but four principal sources. Um, and I, I know this because I've studied, uh, I've read many of the oral histories at the John F. Kennedy Library up in, up in Boston. There, m much of what I'm gonna tell you now comes from oral histories at, uh, at, that, li at that presidential library. Remember Tom Braden? Tom Braden was, uh, well, he was a, he was a socialite and uh, he and his wife became, became the models for a long running television program. I forget what it was called back, I don't know, in the 70s or 80s. Uh, Tom Braden had worked at CIA and he knew and he had retired from CIA by the time of the 1960 presidential campaign, but he stayed very close to many of his former CIA colleagues. And here's what Braden, Tom Braden, said in, uh, in his oral history at the Kennedy Library. I found this. I, I, didn't, expect, I didn't expect to find this when I read Braden's uh, uh, oral history. I, I, I thought I might find something in it for the book that, uh, that I have coming out. But I found this. It's not in the book, but it's useful tonight for this presentation. Here's Tom Braden. I remember taking a walk with Bobby Kennedy in some hotel garden in Los Angeles. And I remember saying to him, did you know we are going to invade Cuba? I really shouldn't have told him that, but my passion for Kennedy's victory was so great uh, that I did anyway. Uh, the fellow in charge of, of this uh, operation against Cuba, I told, uh, I told Bobby, is a great guy and you ought to get to know him right away. His name is Dick Bissell. Bobby raised his eyebrows and he said nothing. I don't know if he'd known about it or not, but he must have. He didn't say anything. So Bobby just heard it. He was Jack's campaign manager. So you know that, you know that very quickly Jack, uh, Jack also heard this from a, a, a really unimpeachable source. Braden still had very, very close contacts at the highest levels of the CIA, including, including Dick Bissell, who was the mastermind, the flawed mastermind of the Bay of Pigs. Now there was also Alab an Alabama governor, a Democrat. A, the governor of Alabama was named John Patterson, and he was very close to Jack Kennedy. He was one of, the, one of, one of Jack Kennedy's uh, most, uh, most prominent, enthusiastic Southern supporters. Uh, Patterson knew about the planning for the Bay of Pigs. You know why? Because the Alabama Air National Guard provided training and, uh, and air support. So Patterson, Patterson was the commander in chief of the Alabama Air National Guard. Provided the planes, not the air support. Provided the planes, sold the planes to... Well, I don't know. There were a couple of Americans who got shot down. And they were from Alabama. Four. Four. And they were CIA contractors. Oh, were they? Well, anyway, anyway, let me tell you about Patterson, Oscar. Uh, Patterson, Patterson was the governor of Alabama. He was basically the commander of the, the Air National Guard of Alabama. The point is, he knew about what was happening with the Bay of Pigs. That's, that's really the issue here. He did not hesitate. 
he called one of Kennedy's uh, closest advisors, I think it was his brother-in-law, Stephen Smith, and he said, I've got something I've really got to talk to Jack about. They met in, they met in a hotel in New York a day or two later. Patterson sat down with the, with, uh, the candidate. Uh, he heard me out and he thanked me, Patterson later recalled. He showed no emotion throughout my entire recounting of what, uh, what was going on with the planning. He showed no emotion. He gave absolutely no sign that he had received any significant information from me. It was exactly the way Bobby had reacted to, to, uh, to Tom Braden. Um, Patterson, uh, but Patterson completely leveled. He told, he told uh, Kennedy everything that he thought Kennedy should know. He was worried, Patterson was very worried about uh, one of those, one of those old, one of those old uh, things that presidential candidates often worry about, especially when they're running for re-election, an October surprise. Kennedy and his campaign were really worried that the invasion, the, the, your, your operation, the, what came to be known as the Bay of Pigs, was going to be sprung in October and to preempt the, 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 the presidential contest and Nixon probably would have won. So they were really worried, and this is why Patterson wanted Kennedy to know right away, because he was worried about an October surprise that could have tilted the election. Um, Patterson, what Patterson told Jack Kennedy and what Braden told Bobby Kennedy wasn't news to, to either one of them, because they had two even better sources. They had the CIA director, Alan Dulles. And they had the flawed mastermind of the Bay of Pigs, Richard Bissell, who were keeping them informed about all of the most important things that were happening. Alan Dulles used to, uh, used to spend a lot of time up at uh, Palm Beach with a, with, a, with a wealthy man who lived a door or two away from Joe Kennedy. And uh, he, would, uh, he would stop in when Joe and Jack were there. He would stop in and Alan would stop in. And, uh, he, uh, there's really, doesn't seem to be any doubt, although there's no documentary evidence, that Alan Dulles was, uh, was filling, keeping Jack very well informed. Uh, inappropriately, Dulles was working for the Eisenhower administration. When I worked at CIA, I only had one boss. It was the man in the White House. And you don't, you don't, you don't work behind the back of your commander in chief. But Alan Dulles did, and so did Dick Bissell. They wanted Jack Kennedy to win. They didn't like Dick Nixon. Remember who the two people were that, that Kennedy announced the day after his victory? He, he went out in front of his house in Georgetown and he announced that he was keeping on two people, high level officials from the uh, previous administration. Alan Dulles and J. Edgar Hoover. Alan Dulles earned his position with, with, Ken, with Kennedy in the Kennedy administration. Now, Dick Bissell and Jack Kennedy had a very, very close relationship. Seymour Hersh, in his book, The Dark Side of Camelot, he discovered many, many meetings that, uh, that Bissell had with Kennedy in the White House after, after, he, after Kennedy occupied the Oval Office. Uh, Bissell, uh, Hersh found this record, these records in the records, uh, declassified records of the Secret Service that kept logs, and they knew the many, many times that Bissell came to see Kennedy. Bissell was keeping Kennedy informed too. Bissell wanted Kennedy to win, and Kennedy had promised Bissell that he would be, after a, after a short period of time, uh, he would be the new CIA director. Of course, the Bay of Pigs scotched that. The, um, the consequences. So Kennedy knew from at least four unimpeachable, high-level sources he used the information that he had to trap Nixon. Nixon could not admit what was really going on. And Nixon had to appear weak and indecisive, that he wasn't, he couldn't take a really tough stance against Castro. Atchison, Dean Atchison, went back to see Kennedy in the White House in March of 1961. This is in his oral history at the Kennedy Library. It's just an interesting little vignette that I think it's worth mentioning in this context. Atchison uh, uh, went, to the, went to the White House and Kennedy said, come over here to the garden. Let's sit in the sun, you and me. And Kennedy said, 
do you know anything about the Cuba proposal? This was in March. This was before, before you landed. Do you know anything about this Cuba proposal? I said I did not. He outlined it for me. I was very, very alarmed. I said I hoped he was not serious. He said, I've not made up my mind yet, but I'm giving it very serious thought. It seemed to me, Atchison said, it was a disastrous idea, a wild idea. And from there, uh, from there I, uh, I, the conversation ended, and a few days later I, had, I took a trip to Europe. And uh, when I came back, uh, I, I, I told the White House that the European leaders that I had encountered were horrified. Uh, with what happened at the Bay of Pigs. They were horrified. They just couldn't believe that uh, this young president had stumbled into such a disaster. And Atchison lost the confidence of Jack Kennedy because he gave a speech to the Foreign Service, the American Foreign Service at the State Department. And here's what he said. The European view, I said, was that they were watching a gifted young amateur practice with a boomerang. This is the way he referred to Kennedy. And Kennedy, I'm not, I don't think Kennedy ever spoke to Atchison. Well, I think he did speak to him again. But he really, he really resented that. Atchison had been right. Kennedy had, Kennedy had trapped Nixon, but Kennedy had trapped himself as well. Kennedy could not escape. After the way he campaigned on Cuba, after the way he trapped Nixon on Cuba, he could not escape the burden. He had to, <laughs> I'm out of time. I'm just about done, Joe. Kennedy, Kennedy could not abandon the Bay of Pigs. He could not have withdrawn his support. He could not have canceled it. If he had, he would have been, he would have been seen as a coward and as a hypocrite, as a liar. The man who campaigned so, so strongly to, to topple, on the need to topple Castro, to support Cuban freedom fighters on the island and, and off the island, uh, he would have seen like a coward and a hypocrite if he had canceled the operation. And he knew that. He would have, he would have canceled the operation, a military operation that had been started, that had, had been spawned by General Eisenhower, the hero of World War II, of the Normandy invasion. How could how could Jack Kennedy cancel a, a military operation that, that had started under the, under the imprimatur of, of, of Dwight Eisenhower? Kennedy made, in my view, some of you have heard me say this before, I think my view is that Kennedy made a cynical, a highly, highly amoral and cynical decision when he decided to go ahead and give you the green light because he knew that the chances were poor, he decided that for him it was better, it would be better politically to go ahead with the intervention than to cancel it. It was called the disposal problem. How, how would he have disposed of the brigade? How would he have explained to, to Americans and to Latin Americans uh, his decision to cancel it? He decided, I believe that he decided it would be better, it would be better to take the disaster of a failure on the beaches than to cancel the intervention. It was the trap that he found himself in that Dean Acheson had warned him against. But Kennedy was interested in winning, and he did win, but he didn't, certainly didn't win at the Bay of Pigs. Thank you.